Welcome to today's panel discussion. In this panel discussion of industry experts from top suppliers, we will level up our FPGA technology skills by continuing our journey as an FPGA developer engineer and considering future FPGA technology needs and design tool trends that should be considered in new product designs. The panel discussion will conclude with a demo of each panelist's favorite FPGA board. If there are relevant questions asked during the discussion, we'll try to work them in. Outside of that, any time left over after the uh, show and tell will be dedicated to Q&A. Uh, panelists today are Jason Bethorum from Xilinx, Stephen Hosmer from Lattice, Martin Kellerman from Microchip, and your moderator is Tom Curran from Abnet. Uh, without further ado, here's Tom. Hi, thank you, Tarek, and uh, thank you everyone out there for attending today to this fun webinar. Uh, like Tarek said, we've got some uh, experts from leading FPGA suppliers. Uh, and without further ado, I'll kick it off to let them introduce themselves. Uh, let's start with Steve from Lattice. Yeah, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Steve Hosner. I'm a uh, senior manager of our Silicon Product Enablement Group here at Lattice. And uh, part of the fun job that I have is uh, producing uh, solutions and development eval boards uh, for uh, folks like yourself uh, to get you uh, quick started into uh, incorporating our uh, products into your into your uh, products. So um, uh, it's great to be here. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Steve. Uh, next up, Martin. Hello. Good evening. Good morning. Whatever time of the day you have. My name is Martin Kellerman. I'm business development manager at Microchip, and in that role. I have the pleasure of really showing the benefit of FPGAs to a lot of different customers and clients. And as you can imagine, this is really a challenging but also entertaining thing at the same time. And a panel discussion of today, that's something that is also part of the job and part of the fun. And I'm very happy to be here and you know, looking forward to this hour. Great. Thank you, Martin. And Jason? All right. Thanks, Tom. I'm Jason Bethorum. I'm Product Line Manager at Xilinx. I cover our entire cost optimized portfolio as well as our Zinc Ultra Scale Plus and Zinc 7000 families. So it's quite a big swath of products, but they are some of our most popular products used in a variety of markets, enabling everything from hardware acceleration, determinism, real time, you know, capability, low latency applications. Uh, we're very excited here to show you some new technologies, new applications we have to get you guys started quickly and easily without having any FPGA experience or even chip down design board experience. So we're very excited that these things are rolling out, trying to make everything all the time easier for you guys to use. Thank you. All right, hey everyone. Um, like Tarek said, my name is Tom Curran. I work here at Avnet uh, on the global products and emerging technologies team. Um, and primarily work on software for FPGAs and processors on FPGAs. And uh, so this topic in particular, um, leveling up our FPGA game is particularly interesting to me. Uh, and like Tarek said, this is a follow-up to a course, a summer of FPGA course that we did earlier, I think late in summer. It's not really summer anymore, but um, the questions that we'll dive into today here are, uh, questions that we received during that uh, summer of FPGA webinar. So this is like a perfect time to get back into that topic and kind of follow up where we left off, um, even though it's now winter, um, but that's okay. Um, so our first question, we'll start off, we'll jump in with Steve. Um, Steve, my first question goes to you, and I wanted to share a question coming from the webinar earlier this year. Uh, at that time, Roger Doe presented an excellent summer of FPGA session on the topic of building processor-based systems on Lattice FPGAs using Propel. And one of our attendees from that session asked us to ask us the following question that I think really helped set the mood for a lot of the discussion here today. And that is, what support is provided for people new to boards and tools? Um, thinking examples more complex than Hello World. And I think that's a great question because we see a lot of tutor tutorials of FPGA 101 type courses where blinking the LED type of activity or printing Hello World to a UART terminal is the final end goal. But then it's not obvious where to go for that 201 level lesson for FPGAs. 
So what's the best path for customers to follow to get to that next level of skills? Yeah, hey, thanks, great question. So uh, uh, there's there's a lot of possibilities here, a lot of aspects uh, that we can consider. Um, you know, there's, there's the question on FPGA 101 or the 201, right, the sophomore level course. And, uh, and he touched on uh, Propel. Um, you know, the, we're talking about a blinky demo. You know, here's a, here's a board that we have, uh, we call it a starter kit. And it just uh, has some LEDs and it has some switches. And uh, yeah, sure, you get that, you open it up, you plug it in, it blinks. What do you do next? Um, you know, so for the, the folks out there where this is all brand new, I would recommend you start playing with it. Uh, we're all engineers. We, we got into this because we like to play and tinker, right? So open up the hood and, uh, and change the, the blinking pattern or the rate. Uh, start to add hard blocks like uh, PLL and see if you can uh, accelerate or, or uh, slow down the input clocks. Um, you can start taking advantage of a lot of the open source uh, community out there and, and add in uh, some free IP for some common functions. From the uh, Propel side, uh, which is Lattice's uh, embedded uh, development tool, uh, we actually have uh, some real good next steps. We call them uh, solution stacks. And they uh, they help, especially if you you know the uh, the 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 blinky LED is kind of a bottom up, and we're going to mess with the with the RTL. But if you want to do more of a top down and start incorporating different blocks, our solution stacks are perfect uh, uh, for for uh, adding things like um, uh, embedded vision or uh, or. Uh, since uh, AI, what, what we call a, our, our AI development kits, right, for artificial intelligence, machine learning, we have security stacks and uh, motor controller industrial automation. So these are perfect uh, uh, building blocks at a higher level, but again, they're, they're the starter position for you to get going quickly uh, uh, with, with designs. Uh, that are a little closer to what the industry trends are requiring today with uh, intelligence at the edge uh, and video. Um, you know, th there's also the traditional options of, uh, of courses that you can take. Uh, most of our companies here represented support uh, universities and uh, your local community college or extension uh, school. Uh, offers good courses that you can enroll or audit um, for even uh, a quicker bang for the buck. The industry uh, also supports uh, Verilog and VHDL training, and that's I don't I don't have any links for that, but that's an easy search. Uh, there's several good courses out there, good instructors, one or two days or even a week uh, for uh, for language training, and they really get you off to the uh, the next level. Oh, great. Those um, solution stacks sound like a, a great way to get started with sort of application-specific tasks. So that's, that's very interesting. Uh, next question uh, goes to Martin, who presented an excellent summer of FPZ, FPGA session in early September uh, entitled Intro to Smart Embedded Vision Using Polar Fire FPGAs, where you showed us a great example of Polar Fire Video Kit which is built as a smart design for your for the microchip Libero SOC design suite. Uh, during your Q&A session, an, an attendee asked, can I add my own HDL to a smart design? And you gave a good overview of the process behind doing this for a simple piece of IP and taking additional steps for generating AXI-enabled IP blocks, which can be connected to the processor easily. Can you perhaps elaborate on this process and speak as to why it is important for designers to be able to build their own HDL IP into an FPGA design. Why not just use standard IP blocks from the catalog for all the peripheral functions like we do for microcontrollers or ASSPs? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, very intense question, uh, very good one. So why, uh, I would put it down first of all to the why do you do that? And why is it important to have those specific IPs? And that brings you to really the, 
the core of the FPGA, what is the core of the FPGA? It's the flexibility. It's the the possibility to build something. And if you compare it to a microcontroller, on a microcontroller, you are just using what you have. And that's what you have. And either the microcontroller is good, or you need to have a, a different one, or you need to emulate something. So some effort there. On the FPGA, it's, it's different. So it's not using what you have, but building what you need. And personally, my favorite theme of FPGAs is just this one here, Lego for engineers. You have building blocks, you have defined blocks of a certain size, of a certain complexity, sub uh, components, and out of these, you can build something. And this is really the, the major benefit of the FPGA and just having something, but then running somewhere out in, in just somewhere that doesn't help. So you really need to integrate it somewhere. And that's why, again, standards are helping. So if I just build something here and here and here and nothing fits together, it doesn't really help me. But the X interfaces, that's one of those um, core interfaces that more or less anyone is supporting. And with that, you also, again, get the flexibility, but also the, the complexity together of building those systems that are doing what you need. Plus integrating it also with those IPs from the catalog that are still required. So why would you want to reinvent the wheel for a UL interface or an SPI interface? Doesn't really make sense, so you can just use that. But if you need something specific to control your dedicated hardware, maybe your dedicated motor where you can use also dedicated uh, motor control IP or something that is special, then you really need to have this flexibility plus the possibility of bringing that together. And those Axie interfaces, um, if you define them in the tool, and if you can connect them up, that's just a tremendous step and a very easy way of doing that. And the way to do it is really just in the smart HLS block, define on you want to have an interface as an Axie interface or bring some shared variable into that. And that's kind of the question on the how do you do that? Uh, there are also a couple of uh, very excellent tutorials on our GitHub page for Smart HLS, and those are showing exactly that point. So having one interface, in one uh, flavor, you just have an Axie 4 streaming interface, in another one, just a different option, and you go for a FIFO interface. So again, the flexibility, but still also the same point of um, yeah, the standard support. Yeah, like uh, the flexibility of the FPGA fabric and that structure, the infrastructure of the Axie interconnect, that's a pretty powerful combination when integrating custom IP. Um, Absolutely. Jason, my, my final community event question goes to you. And that is, uh, it also comes from a few attendees at one of our summer of FPGA's events. Back in August, Brian Fletcher from uh, AFNET had a four-part series entitled Xilinx Avato and Vitus Workshop with the Avnet Ultra 96 V2, where he covered a number of design activities, including adding a PWM IP block to a design using the IP integrator workflow for Vavato ML. Uh, one of the attendees in that event asked, and I'm going to paraphrase it here doing the, the colorful language that was used, was, how does one know how to add all those changes for adding a simple PWM? If this is what's necessary for a one-line output, how does one handle a more complex task? And another attendee came back with a response to the, the other attendee's question saying that, aside from the tutorials and examples, there are, our, there are also open RTL designs that can be reused or adapted from forum posts to avoid having to reinvent the wheel. So I am hoping that you can address that question and tell us a little bit about ways that Xilinx makes it easy to leverage example designs or other designs that community members share back with the rest of the world. Oh, thanks, Tom. Yeah, it's uh, everybody has to take a deep breath when we're talking about designing with <laughs> FPGAs and SOCs like we're talking about. I, agree, I totally get it. If you design with an ASSP, uh, from any processor company out there, you simply get a BSP, you know, board support package with that ASSP. And as uh, you know, we uh, Martin mentioned, we just it's just a fixed function device. Here's all the peripherals you get. Here's all the I/O you get, and here's the drivers for all those. And good luck. Hopefully, that solves everything you need to do in your design. 
And it, you know, in many cases, most customers, especially they think, let's take like the vision video applications, they can, they've got enough in there and they can run their C code, run a scalar processing engine and do one thing at a time, transfer one thing out of memory at a time, get it back get a new video frame, pass it back, video frame, back and forth of memory. You could do it, it'll work. And guess what? That's easy. You didn't have to do anything right except write some C code. And they might even have some tutorial that shows you how to do it. The problem is you're just doing everything in a sequential and scalar fashion. And if there's anything else going in your design, that's a problem, right? Because then it interferes or it interferes with that cycle time you needed to do the video processing. But I'm, you know, bringing that back to the question: when you're building a design for an FPGA, we give you all of the flexibility. And now we're building SOCs as well, which is an FPGA plus uh, a uh, processor. And we're even building ACAP systems now, which we consider the next level, more hardened peripherals around the processor plus your programmable logic. But the programmable logic is what it allows you is to break free from that scalar processor, sequential processing mode and do things in a more uh, deterministic and, and in higher performance fashion where you can localize, as Martin said, you can localize some of your key IP out of the processing domain into the lo programmable logic domain and then accelerate that functionality. But it's more than just being able to access the IP and put it in the hardware. Like you can build some kind of, of course, image signal processing chain doing, a, you know, screen, you know, are, are doing resolution changes or color domain, color conversion, you know, things like all those things. You could do all those things. And I think there's IP for all that. But what really enables those IP is that when you look inside our programmable logic domains, you don't just have logic gates, you have memory as well. And that ability to bolt that memory onto that custom IP logic is the real differentiator. Anything you do, when you push data through a system, the you know, memory has to be buffered and stored between each of these IP logic elements. And of course, or, or coefficient storage for filters and things like that need to be stored locally. And that's where the FPGAs make a real big difference. So if you really st take a step back from this and look at it at a holistic level, what are you doing when you get this device from us? you're building, let's just say you just start with a pure FPGA. You can build an entirely built, uh, custom built microcontroller with an entirely custom built image signal processing chain with an entirely built custom memory hierarchy map to accelerate that ISP chain. Uh, and of course, build as many IOs as you want. So we did the example with one PWM going out. Well, what if you were driving an LED signage board and you'd hundreds of LEDs to drive in a panel, right? And you're connecting a bunch of these together to build a big greater array of panels. And you're doing image signal processing to make sure the color mapping is the same between all of the panels. Well, do that in a processor or an ASSP. Good luck, <laughs> all right? You, but to do it in FPGA or SOC, you can do it, but just thinking about what you just did. You've built an entirely custom chip, uh, an ASIC, if you will. And do you think anybody builds an ASIC in two hours? Probably not. But what we showed you in that demo before and what we have other demos, I, I don't know, I'm not sure how to share a link to the uh, field here, uh, Tariq, but uh, we've just released another video on how to do that PWM demo because it's, it's a building block. But that takes you within about a 20 or 30 minute period building a completely custom microcontroller with a, uh, a total, totally uh, hardware isolated domain into a PWM interface and controlling, yes, just one simple PWM, but of course that's expandable. And if you can do all that in 20 minutes, I think that's incredibly powerful. Uh, all of us on this call, including myself, have been doing this, this FPGA game for a long time. I'm about, I'm about 30 years into it now, and it's never been easier than right now to get started and build building uh, designs from scratch and building custom microcontrollers with custom peripherals attached. Uh, so it's really a game changer, the new tools we all have that are enabling this. And um, again, we are constantly producing more and more reference designs for you guys to get started. So you, uh, you can enable, you can jumpstart your designs and get you started quicker. And with, you don't have to go through the whole pain and process of learning everything you need to know about FPGAs. Get started, build something, learn something new, implement that, learn something new, implement that. That's kind of the new model we see people who are using our devices. And as they do more and more of that, you start to become experts, you start to ask more intelligent questions. And that's what panels like these are for. We hope some of you have already gotten started right, writing some code and doing some demos and, and playing with their devices. And this is your chance to get some feedback from us. And hopefully that answers your question, but it is a very complicated thing we are doing here when you think, when you look back, step back and look at what we're doing. So 
but we are making it easier every day. That's always the goal, right? In, in speaking right. of soliciting feedback, um, uh, attendees, please uh, keep an eye out for the poll questions that um, pop up on your screen and fill them out the best you can. That, that The results of those polls are something that we're all very, very interested in, and um, your input is very, very valuable. So uh, our next section is to dive into the topic of the future of design tools. And this time we'll start with Steve. Um, I, prog I started programming FPGAs using a schematic capture tool and JTAG to load the programming files to the device. And this goes back quite a ways because, like Jason said, 20, 30 years. Uh, yeah, so can I still do this? Is it still possible to use schematic capture as a design entry? Hey, Tom. So, uh, uh, great question. Is um, we're we're, uh, we're answering the future of the tools by looking backwards a little bit. Interestingly enough, at least here at Lattice, uh, the answer is yes, yes, and no. You can still uh, program certain devices that we provide um, and support it with traditional schematic entry. Uh, but these are, uh, you know, somebody saying these are, this is what I did 20, 25 years ago. Uh, they're probably thinking of simpler devices, the PALs, the GALs, the PLDs, maybe even a, a CPLD, a complex PLD, with, uh, you know, hundreds or a small number of thousands of the logic gates. Um, Lattice still sells and supports these products, and uh, we support them with our legacy software, ISP Lever. Uh, ISP Lever Classic. It still supports schematic entry, but again, this is uh, this is yesterday. Uh, today, the real answer is uh, no. FPGAs are are much too large with thousands or hundreds of thousands uh, more logic elements, and it's really impractical to uh, to support a design of that size and complexity with the schematic uh, uh, schematic entry. The industry has adopted hardware description languages, HDLs, like Verilog and uh, VHDL, because of their efficiency and uh, actually a relative ease of use. All the modern design tools from uh, all of our companies here, uh, uh, all the modern design tools support really only HDL entry for our FPGAs. And that includes our Lattice, uh, Diamond, and Radiant, uh, and Propel tools. So uh, uh, qualified, yes, uh, but mostly no. Schematic entry is something we did uh, last year. Hope that answers yeah. your question. It does, thank you. Yeah, many years ago. Yeah, gone are the days of drawing a, a picture at, at the flip-flop level, right? It seems that these days when I see schematic capture, it's more at a much higher level of abstraction dealing with bigger blocks of IP and logic not not down at the gate and flop and LUT level. Um, so Martin, you're up next. Uh, one thing I found with different FPGA vendors is that there are different tools provided for each vendor. In some cases, these tools go obsolete or are not extended to be compatible with newer FPGA devices. Considering there is a growing move in the open FPGA area, do you see a possibility of a universal tool for FPGA development that is supported across all vendors? Mm -hmm. That's a good one. So this really this open source community and how you would utilize that for going really to the different architectures of FPGAs. And um, probably up until recently, I would have said, no way, way too different. And it's really you have the different tools, you have the different projects, you have potentially also slightly different philosophies of doing something in the tools. But um, recently, just based on the market situation, I was in discussion with several clients on, can we do something on exchanging some of those FPGAs? And based on that, it was really also an eye opener for me. So it's also the, the point of, that Stephen just made on HDL, VHDL, Verilog. Those, originally were really intended to just describe the behavior of the hardware and independent of what is underlying. Yes, obviously you can have all the different specific blocks that are in the architectures and utilize them by just instantiating them or calling them and relying on the synthesis tool. And that's probably one level um, that you can have on just 
using those blocks and there is typically very often a lot of HDL in the designs. And if you look at that migrating between the different tools, um, you can very often just import from one tool into the other. And if you look at the project files, it's also very often just an XML file, which you can trace, which you can um, take data out, see what sources are, are in there. And I recently did some Python scripting on that with a bit of help from a colleague of mine. And we just took an ISE file, XISE file, an XML file, and uh, converted it into a liberal file. So just converting something from one of the other FPJ vendors into our tools. And it was pretty straightforward. Obviously, yes, mm -hmm. there are components in there that are not supported on our architectures, but a clock buffer is a clock buffer. You just name it differently and things are done. Right. And I suppose if, uh... If the Verilog or VHDL were written in a pure RTL with no architecture-specific elements described or, or netlisted, if you will, in the HDL, mm -hmm. then then going from one um, FPGA supplier to the next would be even more seamless. But um, to write the most efficient HDL often does require adding in architecture-specific elements. Uh, from each, you know, from whatever your vendor of choice is or supplier that you're you're targeting. So um, it all depends on how, I guess it all depends on how tightly you want to couple and uh, and target your hardware or whether or not how Probably. hard do you want to work to keep your your options open. Yeah, you can definitely do those components and you typically have those in there. But if you think about what you did with them, so it's again, going back one step and think about what you want to achieve and why you did certain things. And doing a one-to-one -one replacement of a certain component very often is maybe not necessarily the, the best way of doing it, but really think of doing something. And then it can be potentially really just replacing it, potentially taking something from the open source community, or also just instantiate some different IP component and put in a little bit of a shim. And that's also something. So from my sure. experience, it was probably about an hour's, hour worth of time. And then I had the first synthesis run uh, work uh, correctly. So this Excellent. migration paths are actually pretty open by now. Excellent. So um, Jason, next question for you. Um, I haven't seen public FPGA designs that did not use VHDL or Verilog. Um, are there any that exist that you know of? Uh, the question is, yeah, <laughs> that's an interesting one because I don't think we've published a RTL-based reference design in a long time. <laughs> All we do publish anymore are, uh, are really higher level type application designs. Um, there are tons. Hackster.io is a great place to start looking. Um, some of the collateral we're creating are another uh, on our Zonix. If you go to Zonix, dot com slash community you'll find a bunch of reference designs there that are far from rtl based designs uh, we have a few influencers that we work with and um and some other people in the industry that are uh, on social media and uh, i just one of them i just uh, i follow and and we don't even pay him or anything he just posted a a whole tutorial or a whole demo of how he did a video processing design using our vivado hls tool which takes c code and ports it into RTL code. So you don't even, it doesn't even, sh you can see the RTL code it produces, but you don't have to look at it. Nobody wants to anyway. Um, and he did the whole thing and he, his commentary, and again, we did not solicit him or pay him. His was, I couldn't believe this worked the first time I did it. I wrote C code, it put in the FG, and then my video design and is running. Uh, and so there are tons of reference designs like this, and we're trying to push a lot of these people to put these on community resources like Hackster.io or Xilinx.com community. And you'll see a lot of the collateral we're producing now, like the video link I put in the chat. Uh, that is done completely using our Vivado API tool. And to follow on to that question I just answered before, the Vivado API tool is, all it is is an IP block design, graphical design tool. You write no RTL code. You can write RTL to code and bring those ports up to the block level design, but the block level design design is purely schematic like based and then you'll find in an IP catalog you'll find over 250 IP in that catalog everything from image signal processing PWMs timers Ethernet uh, memory interfaces everything you, you possibly could think to build is generally in that IP catalog and those are simply drag and drop plug and play um, type of IP 
And, uh, and that's where I'm saying we're getting to that next level of abstraction. And uh, most of the customers I've even talked to and working with are generally starting in that Vivado IPI or IP integrator type design and flow environment. And then if they have to write a, a really high speed or high performance IP block or some unique IP block specific to their design, they can write that in RTL code and then import that into the IP block design and connect it in, through the AXI interconnect into uh, their microcontroller, whether it's our microblaze soft processor or our ARM uh, Cortex-A type processors and our Zinc class devices. So yes, uh, there are tons of reference designs and we are enabling the world to start doing much more higher level abstraction to this. And uh, we support languages like Python, C, uh, frameworks uh, from GStreamer up to ML type frameworks um, that are, exist out there as well. So just any type of framework out there, we're adding support to optimize that into our FPGAs. Great. Hey, um, I just noticed uh, a question come in from uh, the audience. So before we dive into our next section, I'll, I'll toss this question to Jason. And I think it tackles a topic that I think sometimes FPGAs get a bad rap for, and that's power consumption. Um, so Jason, um, is, is there a way to keep power consumption of the FPGA and SOC or SOC reasonable? Uh, yes, uh, let's break that question down into two pieces. One piece you're gonna have a hard time getting away from, the other piece you have full control over. The first thing is there's static power. Static power is the power that you have, think of like lighting a candle and <laughs> you light the candle Candle. It takes so much energy to get that candle lit. That's what we do. You, 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 you. Uh, you the static power when you turn on the FPGA or SOC, you have to turn on all of this. You know, the all of the uh, the die area. Um, now, after that point, you know that's your static power. That's the power power you're always going to have in the device. After that, it's dynamic power. Dynamic power is the circuitry you put on top of the FPGA that you're running inside the FPGA. And of course, dynamic power is a function of frequency. So the faster you run things, the more power you're going to burn. And therefore, in there are cases where you can isolate uh, pieces of your circuitry that you're, you're not using all the time, and then either shut the clocks off to that, you know, through clock gating, or just slow down the clocks when you're in a sleep mode, things like that. So there's ways to uh, intelligently control the power in your design. Now, that's just in a pure FPGA. I want to flip this over to to like an SOC device, like our Zinc Ultra Scale Plus device. Our Zinc Ultra Scale Plus device, we knew this power is gonna be a problem and we intelligently de designed this device. Like I said, when you turn on a device, you have to light up the entire device. That's not true with Zinc Ultra Scale Plus. Zinc Ultra Scale Plus has the ability to turn on and off different power domains. In fact, we have four power domains inside the device. So you can turn them all off or one off. And in fact, one of the power domains is called the battery backed up domain and that will run in the hundreds of nanowatts of range of power and still keep the device alive and be, be able to wake it up. And you can turn on any one of the power domains or all of the power domains. And you can also, within power domains, shut off certain components within those power domains. So you have an incredible amount of flexibility inside here. And not only that, can you turn on and off the power domains? This control block inside the Zinc Ultra Scale Plus called the PMU, it has the ability to also uh, to change clock rates within the power domains, so to control that uh, that uh, that dynamic power. So in Zinc Ultra Scale Plus, you have the ability to fully turn on and off and, and influence your static power and your dynamic power. And uh, there's a, a companies out there, third-party companies, are doing really cool things that uh, they're leveraging the timers and the performance monitors inside Zinc Ultra Scale Plus to do a real-time analysis of, analysis of your design running in real time. And what this enables you to, you to do is get a snapshot of your design as it's running in a real-time environment. And this tool gives you feedback to tell you, well, you could potentially in this mode, these are the modes of operation we see. And in this mode, you could actually slow, slow these clocks down. We were actually in a competitive situation with an ASSP over a power and that ASSP provider showed, oh, we're way lower than the Xilinx uh, SOC. And then uh, we applied this third-party tool to their design and gave them, uh, and it actually will kick out the firmware for you automatically too. So it uh, it can, it'll it'll implement this what it learns into your design. And after running this firmware on the PMU inside Zinc Ultra Scale Plus, the power management unit, it um, got our power down to 40% less than the ASSP. So is there a way to do this? Absolutely. There takes some intelligence, and there's third-party partners out there 
that are helping enable this uh, in, our, in our devices. So you can focus on your key competencies and leverage these other IP and partners to help accelerate and improve your designs. I would just add to that one. So also an important topic here is really temperature. So the static that Jason, Jason just mentioned, that's um, maybe pretty low if you are working at room temperature. But as soon as you go really into the interesting areas, somewhere in a cupboard uh, where there is really the electronics also sitting around 60, 70, 80 degrees ambient temperature, then really the static is kicking in. That's really the, the biggest part then. And um, the dynamic that you can control is really getting smaller and smaller there. And that's what I also see with my clients when we talk about polar fire, the, really the low power consumption, that's just an absolute kicker. It really uh, is a, an absolute big level where you really have the differentiation then of the, the reasonable performance plus the really good power consumption. And bringing that small power envelope in, that's really just bringing that benefit of the FPJs if you do it rightly, as Jason rightly said. Yeah. And I think a key differentiator there between, say, Microchip and Xilinx then is a flash based versus SRAM based. And that, that definitely has an impact on power as well, doesn't it? Absolutely. So if you think about the flash technology, there is just the, the floating gate and you don't really have to recharge anything. It's um, the configuration is stored inside of the FPJ. And with that, you inherently First of all, you have a couple of system benefits. You don't need the boot process or the configuration process at the beginning, but then also at runtime. You don't have the, all the leakage, so leakage significantly re, uh, reduced, and with that then also resulting in low power and still at very reasonable performance, good performance for most applications. So for the mid-range device, is really a very, very nice fit. Yeah, agreed, indeed. So uh, coming up to our next section, the future of FPGA devices, you know, we'll come right back to you, Martin. Um, sometimes an FPGA is too costly or complex for the end application where a dedicated MCU is better suited. However, many of these MCU don't have any additional logic, although the CLC, or the configurable logic cell for those not familiar with microchip acronyms, uh, in the microchip range is very good, perhaps for a bespoke decoder circuit. Uh, do you think there will be a technology migration to increase some additional programmable FPGA around MCUs, such as AVR or PIC, uh, to create flexible and powerful devices with custom design peripherals and logic control, which is independent of the MCU? Mm -hmm. So if you would directly ask me kind of a PIC, including with a, an FPGA, probably unlikely. But if you look at a small FPJ, it's a small footprint, small logic complexity going into those areas. Yes, there are areas where an FPJ is not suitable. If there is really a component that does the job that you need, then make your life easy, take that component. But for those components or for those tasks where you are actually running into that problem of uh, the army sizes of the FPJ or the of the PICs or of any microcontroller, either too large or too small, then it's where you can get in with the FPGA again. And for those guys that were working on the small microcontrollers that maybe already have some experience on the C code, then the newer tools like the, the high-level synthesis tools, Smart HLS, those are really bridging that gap from the controller, from the small processor into the FPGA. And also, additionally, if you think about having this very small controller together with the FPJ fabric. There are also solutions out there. Um, people like Ken Chapman created something really cool, the, the Pico Blaze or the Ken Chapman's programmable state machine. That's really a very small and highly optimized um, controller, also available in open source for other architectures. And that working that working having that work together with an FPJ fabric, that's just a really very big level there as well. So from small controller, from a kind of a macro, plus the FPJ, if you want to really write the, F, uh, the VHDL code, or also then again, as I said, high-level synthesis, smart HLS from the C++, C++ to the FPGA. Yeah, I worked on a project once using Ken Chapman's PicoBlaze for doing a one-wire interface to a, a um, security EEPROM 
And that, um, so, yeah, it's a very neat little microcontroller, if you will, that you know, runs in the FPGA Fairbank. That was a fun project to work on. Yeah, when it um, comes to processor scalability, sorry to jump in, but there you can do processing scalability all the way down from 8-bit controllers all the way up to 64-bit and uh, multi-core, <laughs> multi-processing controller in FPGAs now. Some of these are soft-based solutions and some are hardened. But across all of us now, we're all making processing enabled devices and that's just really increasing the performance and flexibility of of uh of designs around the world mm, it sure is. and if you imagine an fpj fabric in principle it's really this um optional peripheral that you were missing on your processor just have the processor whatever it is um from 8 to 64 bit plus than my peripheral that i really wanted Yes, it's like Christmas. You get what you want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I really wanted an ASSP that did this. Oh, well, you can make it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the world is your oyster, so to speak. So, Jason, right back at you. Um, a problem I see for the maker slash hobbyist community and those also undertaking low production or bespoke designs is that leap to move away from a development board and onto a custom PCB is very difficult due to BGA style packaging and other newer footprints. Um, many of the simpler PCB designs will stop at, it at device pitches like SOIC for targeting these types of users. While a, a very small part of customer base, perhaps some pre-soldered modules with uh, castellated one-tenth inch centered pins would be a useful option in your inventories to help those customers integrate your latest devices. Are there any plans to release any boards that have these types of uh, pre-soldered device modules? Uh, it's a, there's a, a lot in that question. I'm gonna try it in their sake of time because we haven't even gotten to our demos yet, but uh, and my demo is highly cent uh, centralized around answering this question. Um, but the fact of the matter is there's no doubt about it. All of our devices are getting more complex. Uh, the performance is increasing, um, the density is increasing, which you would force us to really make bigger chips, um, which we know nobody can tolerate that. Everybody wants smaller chips and higher compute density. So yes, we are taking very complex systems and putting them into very small packaging now. In fact, we've just introduced the new packaging technology that really gets you down to virtually the size of the die, which is incredible compute density. But at the same time, we know we know that's difficult for many customers, especially don't have chip down design knowledge to implement. You have to, you know, of course, build your board and then of course, design the chip. That's a double fold sword you have to, you know, endure. However, what we are doing uh, and which you'll see from our latest offerings that we are now producing, uh, going, uh, you know, producing additional SOMs that are in the marketplace. We have a bunch of third party SOM manufacturers that have produced great solutions from Avnet to in Clustra and Trends, and now we are building SOMs as well. And ours are gonna have more of a targeted application focus. And the first one we just released out is the Korea Vision AI Starter Kit SOM. This is a great place for customers to get started and just leverage the SOM. Then you can simply just build your own carrier card. So we've taken the complete, all the a complexity of the design away from you from the FPGA or the SOC, given you a simple, very small form footprint SOM with a, uh, a header interface that you can connect to a carrier card that does your end application. And you'll see from us, we're gonna start rolling out more and more of these carrier cards for different applications. We, uh, we've we just, of course, launched the Vision AI starter kit with the Korea SOM. And, and by the way, these are very low cost as well. Uh, so not only do we have that one, we're going on to robotics and other applications. And we're gonna, we're, We'll have, uh, you know, some of our partners are working on development carrier cards to do more IO expansion for more flexible design prototyping environments. So we believe this solution is what's going to enable our hacker world and low volume customers to get incredibly good pricing on our devices, as well as jumpstart their designs and hit their market quickly. And our, again, if we ever get to the demos, you'll see how we're doing this with the Korea solution. Yeah, one more question, and then we then we jump to the demos, and it's perhaps a uh, uh, a happy coincidence that there aren't many questions from the, the from the audience yet, so maybe that'll change when we get to the demos. But uh, Steve, last question up for you, and it's a big juicy one. 
Um, last year, NVIDIA announced its intentions to acquire ARM, and, it, and they insist that it will keep ARM neutral to all the companies, and there are so many of them, um, that are currently licen licensing ARM's IP for their chips. Um, there is still a lot of worry that that might not work long term, and the industry giving, is giving the side eye, keeping an eye out to the open source RISC-V architecture as a possible escape hatch. Um, although that would take a massive co coordinated industry-wide effort to replace ARM. Um, how can FPGA devices help designers build some additional flexibility to navigate this uncertainty the whole industry is facing around this development? Yeah, Tom, great question. Uh, it's it's a, a natural for FPGAs to be able to provide that flexibility. That's, uh, that's what we're in the business for. Um, it, the answer is very similar to uh, what, what Martin mentioned for portable uh, FPGA design, right? Uh, in the uh, processor land, if you can keep your designs at the high enough level uh, so that it's portable, you know, C code is C code. Now that's, uh, I'm waving my hands and, you know, uh, it's not as easy as that. Um, but, uh, you know, ARM is, is very strongly entrenched in the industry. It has uh, great support, a uh, great ecosystem, but it's not the only one out there. Um, Lattice, for example, has uh, has uh, chosen Risk Five uh, because of its performance and footprint benefit uh, for our devices. Now, that's uh, you know something we will continue to look at as we go forward. Uh, but all of the companies are continuously evaluating what is uh, what is the best choice going forward. So, uh, you know, other processors exist out there that are based on different things. Uh, but FPGAs and, and coding are inherently flexible um, so that you can you can pull out an ARM and put in a RISC-V or put in a MECO32 or put in a MECO Blaze. And, uh, you know, the, what what we can do is uh, is just to be smart as we are, are designing our code and uh, you know the trade-off again is is portability sometimes versus efficiency. But if you can go uh, go with the more portable, then you are better positioned as the landscape may change. And I'll just I'll just leave it there and keep it short so we can move on to demos. And it is demo time. And if I remember correctly, we were going to kick off demos with you, Steve. Oh, perfect. Um, I have ooh, behind me. I don't know if you can see this very well. Maybe the lights are. Uh... This is uh, this is our embedded vision development kit, and one of the reasons that I've uh, chosen this one uh, to showcase is it contains uh, a very flexible three-board stack with an input board, a, uh, a processor board, and an output board. So our input board, we can swap out. And on this one, you can see I have four cameras. These are Sony IMX258 uh, uh, high def cameras. And uh, in, in the middle here is a low power Crosslink NX device with the uh, MIPI DeFi's. So, uh, you know, there was a question about power, power, and yes, static power is the thing that kills you. So you want to right size your FPGA, uh, and you want uh, FPGA technology that uh, that uh, is low power in its uh, in its construction. Lattice devices uh, showcase this. So uh, I'm going to show a couple of demos that show applications where we are at the edge. And uh, in fact, in many applications, we are the only device on. We are lower power than uh, other expensive uh, power hogs, you know, like the processor. So we are always listening or we're always watching. Uh, and so in case something important happens, we'll wake up that processor. Uh, but let's go ahead and uh, show a couple of demos of applications uh, showcase. 
What you see here is a development board equipped with the Crosslink NX FPGA based on the new Lattice Nexus platform. The FPGA has been programmed to perform camera aggregation, which is a common embedded vision use case found in many applications. As you can see, the board is equipped with four different image sensors, each pointing in a different direction and looking at a live feed of typical objects that you would find around a car. The FPGA aggregates the four video streams into a single video stream using a combination of the embedded hard MIPI D5 course as well as the soft CSI2 IP course. Now, all this functionality is being implemented at 300 milliwatts of power consumption, and there's additional resources in the FPGA to do other functionality, such as image signal processing, to further improve the image quality. Thank you for your time. Yeah, perfect. And let's just jump right into uh, the, the second video. It highlights our uh, AI Hello, machine. Hello, everyone. What you see here is a development board equipped with the Crosslink NX FPGA based on the new Lattice Nexus platform. The FPGA has been programmed to perform human presence detection and counting, which is a common AI use case found in many applications. As you can see, there is a bounding box around the upper half of my body indicating that my presence has been detected and my movements are tracked as well. Next, I would like to invite a couple of volunteers to stand in front of the camera. And you can see that all three of us have been detected and the count has been updated as well. So all this functionality is being implemented at half the power consumption and double the performance of the prior generation solution by utilizing the advanced architectural innovations of the Nexus platform, including the addition of the large RAM blocks and the faster fabric performance. Thank you for your time. Yeah, so uh, terrific. The uh, you know we're, we're showcasing our low power, and that obviously was a question that came up today. Uh, but you know we were also at, uh, talking about uh, you know how to go on the next step. These uh, this embedded development kit and the video interface uh, platform devices uh, are perfect for the solution stacks uh, that I mentioned as a as a next step. Uh, as as you are learning and going forward in adopting the FPGA technologies uh, into uh, uh, products for for your company. So I'll leave it at that. We'll go see the next one. Um, uh, thank you for your time today. Yeah, thank you. That's very impressive. Definitely very impressive, Steve, and very interesting. And so uh, next up we have Jason. Yeah, I just I will just make it quick too. This is what I was just getting at with our Creosom and the solutions we're putting around it. What I just want to supplement the video with is just that this is going to show you our new Crea platform and our Crea App Store, and you'll see more about this in the App Stores. We're going to allow we'll not only upload apps, but allow our user communities to upside, upload apps and user communities to not only upload apps but monetize them when other people want to implement and purchase these apps. So this is a new. Uh, solutions model we're, we're rolling out with the Korea and let's roll the video. Xilinx unveiled a new way to bring adaptive computing to the world. The production ready Korea SOM adds a new method of deploying adaptive computing at the edge with no prior FPGA experience. In this video, we're going to take a look at the out of the box ready, low cost KV260 Vision AI starter kit and demonstrate how quickly and easily you can run a smart camera accelerated application on it. Let's take a look at the KV260 Vision AI starter kit first. The kit is a compact, power efficient development platform that fits in one hand, ideal for your Vision AI applications. The starter kit has the SOM, which is connected to the Vision Carrier Card via a single connector. Vision Focused Carrier Card, which has two IAS connectors and a 15-pin Raspberry Pi connector to plug in the Raspberry Pi camera module. You can connect up to eight cameras through a combination of IAS, Raspberry Pi connector, USB, and Ethernet ports. These features make this an ideal starter kit for Vision AI applications. On one edge of the starter kit, you'll see the Gigabit Ethernet RJ45 connector, four USB ports, HDMI and DisplayPort connectors, and the DC barrel jack connector for power. 
This starter kit comes with a getting started document inside the box that contains a QR code and hyperlink to give you online step-by-step instructions. Xilinx offers a basic accessory pack for the KV260 starter kit. The pack consists of power supply adapter, micro USB, HDMI, Ethernet cables, SD card and SD card reader, and an AR1335 IAS camera module. That's everything you'll need to jumpstart your first Xilinx accelerated application for Vision AI. You can purchase the Crea KV260 basic accessory pack from both Xilinx and distribution partners' websites. Now let's see how quickly and easily you can set up the whole kit and successfully run the Smart Camera Accelerated application. Have the KV260 starter kit and basic accessory pack ready. Grab the 16 gigabyte micro SD card from the starter kit and flash the WIC SD card image provided by Xilinx. The Getting Started webpage has instructions for various operating systems. Note that I've already programmed my micro SD card, so let's go to the next step. The next step is to insert a programmed micro SD card, connect the cables, camera module, USB keyboard, and an HDMI capable monitor to the starter kit. Before you power up the starter kit, configure the communication channel setup via the COM ports. Again, the Getting Started webpage has instructions for the driver and terminal program configuration. I used the PuTTY program on my host machine. Now turn on the kit. The power LED should illuminate. Check on the terminal window to see the boot sequence. This was the final step for the hardware configuration. Let me run the Smart Camera Accelerated app. From the Linux prompt, I executed the following commands as shown on the screen. The Smart Camera Accelerated app is up and running. I can see the output on the monitor. As you noticed, no FPGA expertise or hardware experience is needed to run this application. From setting up a KV260 Vision AI starter kit to running the Smart Camera Accelerated app, it took less than one hour. This pre-built Smart Camera Accelerated app is a great evaluation and entry point to develop high performance and flexible Smart Camera applications for many use cases. Eager to try out other accelerated applications as well? The Xilinx App Store makes it easy for you to evaluate, purchase, and deploy accelerated applications in just three steps. Several Xilinx and partner applications are available at the Xilinx App Store. Browse the Xilinx App Store catalog and find the right application for your needs. We also have online training available for getting started and for specific accelerated applications. You can learn about the Korea SOM, how-to guides and tips, and even earn a certificate from Xilinx. Xilinx offers production SOMs in both commercial and industrial temperature grades for production high volume deployment. With the starter kit and production Korea SOM, you can quickly move from development to deployment for various edge applications. To learn more or to purchase the SOM and start kit, visit xilinx.com slash Korea. Yeah, and I encourage you all to check out that website uh, for Korea, zonix.com slash Korea, and you'll find out all the resources you need about that. That's uh, a new exciting direction we're going, and it's getting a lot of great uh, feedback on it so far. I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you, Jason. Great. Thank you. That's definitely a very interesting kit. Very powerful. Uh, and next up, and I know we're a little bit pressed for time, so hopefully you all can stick around. If you had told me when we started this that we'd be running short on time, I, I wouldn't have believed you. but We've had a lot of great questions and answers and some great content here today. So um, please definitely stick around for the rest of the fun with uh, Martin's demo. Yeah. So with me, you'll probably have the best at the end, just shy as I am. So I'm not going to show videos, but I wanted to show a little bit on uh, real hardware and the real software. And as it's coming up to Christmas, I want to show you something proper on that one. So let me do a first screen share um, on that one. So, so the first thing that I want to really show is um, yeah, Python. And that's one of the interfaces that we have into um, doing machine learning and also doing the simulation of machine learning on, our, on just a processor here on 
targeted then um, for vector blocks are machine learning for low power machine learning on our polar fire devices and this is here just a demo where i was taking a couple of images where i was training a network on to detect faces and then to do the detection on um, yeah if it can detect me on some of the images and it's actually pretty straightforward to do that there is a demo on there and you see here uh, Windows subsystem for Linux. So you can just run that Windows 10. You have that Linux system. Um, download from GitHub vector blocks. And then you can do the Python processing. So it's really just process the image that I gave it. And it's pretty quick. doesn't really take long. Um, so there is some person detected in an image. And I'll also show you the image because probably right in the image in the point for Christmas. So here, two people on one photo, me and me, um, in different uh, clothing. And here, OK, the face was not detected, should have shaved a little bit. But here, in some other profession, yep, detected and run on that one. And obviously, this is just here trying it out on the PC. Next step would then be running that on a pro on the vector blocks uh, IP on the FPGA. I'm not going to show that today, but just something else. But again, it would be very easy to do that on, and is very easy to do that on our MPF 300 video kit. And the other demo that is also running again on that um, board is here, Kenny Edge, Edge Detection, Sobo Filter. And you recognize it, we're talking here about C code, C++ code, where you get data, where you do the processing, where you do the calculations. You have, first of all, just the normal main, which is running on, on yeah, here in the test bench. Plus, then you have a relatively small function, which is accelerated, brought into hardware as an IP for FPGAs. And also some sub functions here, like the Gaussian filter, Sobel filter, and all that. And in the interest of time, don't want to run it here at the moment. But what you would typically have is just some small, some image that you input, and then go for the edge detection on the Sobel filter, and then going over into the real, real hardware onto the board. And for that, I'm going to stop sharing here and switch back to my camera. Um, see, um, should be seeing me again. Yes, just take the camera and put it onto a tripod so that you can also see what I am showing here. Deliberately don't want to switch cameras because that typically is just causing a mess. So what you're seeing here is the video kit and the monitor. So here, our video kit, the MPF 300 video kit, connected here with the, those two uh, image sensors pointing over to those guys. Um, my Lego technique that you already saw before, picture in picture also done here on the FPGA. And then as part of the overall demo, also the machine, uh, not the machine learning, the Kenny Edge filter implemented there as part of the image processing. And yeah, with a bit of reasonable light, you can see those guys, the Sobel filtering. You can see my Lego car moving over here all in live stream. So pretty straightforward using Smart HLS and the demo designs that we are bringing with that. Straightforward, very easy to use, and yeah, download them from GitHub on Smart HLS, and you're ready to go. Very cool. So um, I know we're a, a little over time now, but I so that I see another question come in from the audience. I'm curious, uh, Tarek, do we have time for that, or should we answer that offline later? Yeah, anyone anyone that needs to hop off that has a hard stop, uh, feel free to drop off now. But uh, anyone that wants to keep going, we can keep going. Uh, do you want to go ahead and uh, bring that question up for whoever can stick around? Sure. Um, I think, Martin, since you mentioned uh, Smart HLS earlier, this question might be a good one for you. Uh, question is, an opinion I heard a few years ago was that C synthesis was inefficient in terms of FPGA device device performance slash resource usage, usage compared to RTL. Uh, does the panel feel that this gap has been closed? 
or is it a development time versus device efficiency trade-off? So with that, I would say it's both. So I also remember the times of that statement and I have very much the same opinion. The synthesis tools, high-level synthesis tools that you could get at that point in time were really, they all had one common property, extremely expensive and efficiency was debatable. But now with the tools that are around, by now there has a lot of uh, development effort and know-how has been put into those tools and also a philosophy change. Originally, it was really, you press the button, you need a very big run button, and the tool does it all for you. Obviously, this doesn't work. You need to have some engineer, somebody with a brain in front of it, telling the tool or giving it some guidance on what to do. Kind of do some unrolling, do something um, there. I know what I, what I want to have. And that's something that really takes benefits in the tool. And yes, absolutely, it's not 100% efficient. There is always a trade-off. You have some state machine that is controlling something. But again, it's also the trade-off of how long do I take until I get something or and what efficiency do I get? Yes, I can have a highly optimized code and there has been uh, some expert working on it for weeks or months and it's the most optimized way. And then reality kicks in and you need to change something. All the optimizations are down, down the drain. And on high-level synthesis, yes, it may not be that optimal, but it's very quick and very easy to change something. And that's the very big benefit. And the additional one or two lookup tables, maybe 10, 100 lookup tables, that's something that by now you very often can can really um, afford. And just out of curiosity, I was trying something recently, um, some, <clears throat> some very small machine learning code from one of our partner companies in Faxel. Um, Originally, that was something going for Smart Fusion 2 or Polify, but out of curiosity, I put it onto one of our older Igloo devices. Still works. It's very small, very tiny, and you can do the machine learning in a 8 by 8 millimeter device. Wow, very so, interesting. Yeah, it's, it's closing, the, the clo gap is closing. It's still there, but the benefit of high level synthesis is definitely absolutely there. Yeah, I, I think. Uh... HLS also benefits from devices becoming um, more and more dense, right? Big devices still inside small packages. So you've got, if if your HLS design isn't the most super efficient resources wise, you've got extra resources within that package um, to use, right? So you're not, uh, it's kind of like uh, how PCs um, over the years always require more RAM because the, the OS always requires more RAM to run. Um, but you've got it there, you might as well use it, That's, right? So same goes, I think, for HLS designs. And I think it's still the, the old adage of knowing your target hardware and understanding your target um, still applies. It definitely applied back in the days of, of when HLS, like, I'm sorry, like HDLs, started to take over from schematics, um, knowing what you're synthesizing to has a big impact on on uh, your resource utilization in your final target. And it, so the same the same adage applies to HLS as well. The better you understand your underlying target, the better you can target that hardware most efficiently. At least Absolutely. that's my opinion anyway. Absolutely, and um, it's probably kind of the Bavarian approach. You, under, you need to understand what is under, underlying and then you can circumvent it. Yes. Do uh, Jason or Steve, you have anything to add there before we wrap up? Uh, I would just say, yeah, the history of abstraction is there. But even in processors, assembly code was is still more efficient than any C code you'll ever write, but people don't write it anymore. They write C code because the gap has closed. The gap is closing for C synthesis and RTL gates as well. Um, it's getting to the point where, yep, you, you have to make the trade-off. Do I want to invest the development time or just write this? And like I said, there was a influencer just posted something saying how effective and how impressed he was, how HLS worked from the very first time he just used it on a video application. So that gap is closing and, um, and we all have support for that now. So it's an incredible thing to take advantage of. Yep. The gap is closing and the resources are, are, uh, are, are, uh, 
more abundant. available, right? Yeah, abundant <laughs> yeah. is, you know, that's the same thing that saved, in my opinion, Microsoft over the years, right? They they didn't write very efficient code, but uh, <laughs> Intel came along and, and you know, the processors got faster and memories got bigger and, and saved that. We're doing the same thing here in this industry. Our FPGAs are getting uh, larger with much more abundant resources and hard blocks and uh, capabilities. Uh, so uh, between the closing the gap and, and larger devices, it's less of an issue. Yeah, that's a pretty powerful duo. <laughs> yep. Um, and with that, uh, I want to thank everybody that still stuck around to the end. Um, I'm sorry we went over, but I think this was a great webinar. We had some great uh, questions and answers and content, and I really want to give a huge thank you to Steve and Martin and Jason um, for being our panelists today. I think your expertise has been fantastic and, and great for for attendees. Um, that want to learn how to level up their FPGA game. And uh, with that, I'll thank you and pass it back to Tarek. Yeah, um, I, I, I want to thank uh, Tom for an excellent job moderating. And uh, just before we, before we close out, I want to remind people that there are resources for you to dive further from each of the presenters, including past webinars. So if you haven't already, Go check that out, and uh, thank you, everyone, for who participated, and uh, the moderators, and the audience members that attended. So long. Uh, Till next time. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.